Hello. Hey, Joe, how are you today? Hi, Brent, how are you doing? Good, okay. good. We're just letting folks log in here for a moment. Okay, that's fine. I'll get set up. Yeah, get, get yourself ready. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and kick things off here. Um, so thank you all for joining today. Uh, my name is Bryant Jones. I'm the Executive Director of Geothermal Rising. Geothermal Rising is a nonprofit organization with over 50 years of advancing and promoting the geothermal industry. GR builds community, conducts research, and empowers the geothermal industry by aligning with all geothermal technologies and applications. GR is the leading professional development and educational outreach resource for the geothermal industry. Um, before I get started, I have a couple of items I wanted to share with you all. First, the Geothermal Rising Conference is right around the corner, so we want you to register today to learn more about the geothermal industry, technologies, and innovations. Um, the Geothermal Rising Conference is going to be the first week of October this year in Reno, Nevada. Uh, we'll put a link in the, in, the, um, in the chat for everyone so you can register today. And second, GR is launching a fundraising campaign for our Traveling Geothermal Museum exhibit uh, to bring geothermal to communities through these moving exhibits that are gonna go from community to community, town to town. So learn, you can learn more and donate um, to support the, the increasing, uh, in, to support increasing the awareness of geothermal in your community. Uh, we'll provide more information about that. So today we're gonna to be talking about closed loop technologies, which is one of many geothermal applications that can provide heating, cooling, and power to communities, hospitals, schools, and military installations, and uh, so much more. Uh, other applications include uh, engineered geothermal systems or EGS. And as a side note, you may have all, may have all heard of Fervo's Energy's exciting news released yesterday. Uh, there are also hydrothermal systems, which we're more familiar with. And finally, innovating applications um, in the geothermal space that are looking at things like super hot rock geothermal. So anyways, uh, with this background, I'm excited to welcome Joseph Shear and have a robust conversation about closed loop geothermal and green fire energy. Uh, Joe has been leading green fire energy as the CEO for the last nine years. He is an experienced attorney of 33 years in project financing and was the head of the credit finance practice at Cooley LLP, where he took a one-year leave absence to work directly on international power technology, where he financed co-generation projects. He has a substantial project finance experience with conventional co-generation energy projects and renewable energy projects. Joe received his, uh, J his uh, law degree from the University of California, Los Angeles, and an MBA from UCLA's Anderson Graduate School of Management, and has a BA in economics from the University of California at Davis. So Joe, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'll hand the reins over of the, the, of the presentation to you, and you can dig into green fire and closed loop technologies. So over to okay. you. Okay, can you hear me? You're coming in, yes. Okay, shall I share my screen now? Share my screen now? Yes, go ahead and share it and get started, yeah. Okay. All right. Do you see my see my screen? Expanding geothermal resources. Not yet. Try, try again. Do you see my screen? No, I can't see it. No. Nope. Okay. Hmm. Um, okay, I'm gonna try we'll, to share the screen. We'll pull, share yeah, one. we'll pull them up on our side. Okay, here, hold on one second. Well, I, maybe I can do it then. Say, how's this? Now, do you see it? There, there they go. Okay. Yep, okay. now they're, they're here. Here they are. Now, do you see it? We do, yes. Okay, good. So, okay, well, uh, I'll get started then. Well, expanding geothermal through closed loops, what we're doing. 
Okay, we got green fire was started. Um, the uh, uh, the the theory of the anomaly in uh, with salt uh, the anomaly is that uh, there's only two percent of the Earth's geothermal resources that can be used with conventional uh, technology. Um, but um, it, it's uh, uh, the Uh, we want to unlock uh, much more of the geothermal resource. Okay, still seeing my slide? Yep, yep, they're coming in. Oh. Okay, good. Um, so the, yeah, this is what you see uh, here is uh, actually our uh, Um, uh, the picture here is our COSO uh, demonstration project that we completed in 2019, uh, number uh, several years ago, of course. Um, and uh, uh, some of you may have been at that. Uh, we had a, a field trip after our uh, the geothermal rising conference. Uh, uh, down in Southern California, uh, of course. And I'll describe that in more detail uh, uh, later if you'd like. The, uh, but we call uh, our system closed loop technology. And uh, the world now calls uh, closed loop uh, advanced geothermal systems. And uh, 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 that's fine with us, but uh, it's uh, essentially the same thing in terms of the way the world geothermal and industrial applications. Uh, uh, we were started in 2019. We're in San Francisco area is where we're headquartered, uh, Walnut Creek, uh, and we're a privately held commercial company. A number of strategic uh, investors um, and who are also strategic partners. Um, and can you see my whole screen? Hello? Yes, Joe, we can, we can see it just fine. It's coming in great. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so uh, our uh, uh, strategic partners and major investors are Baker Hughes, uh, Hummer and Payne, and Ballarat. Uh, uh, Baker Hughes, of course, huge uh, oil and gas company. And uh, they, uh, we uh, appreciate these relationships, uh, not so much from a financing point of view, although we do appreciate that, but from a strategic capabilities and partnering point of view. We don't have to partner with any of them on projects, but it's great that they're available and uh, want to uh, work with us on projects. And we're working very closely with Baker Hughes in particular on a number of projects around the world already. Um, so of course they have the ability for subsurface reservoir assessing and uh, project management, construction implementation. Hummer Companions, the largest rig supplier in North, North America, or I think it's maybe, yeah, I think it's North America. Um, and uh, it's helpful for us. And Valorac uh, provides um, uh, their huge uh, tubing supplier, uh, both from a casing point of view and from our perspective, uh, vacuum insulated tubing and other insulated tubing. And they have a solid uh, insulated tube. So there are multiple types of tubulars uh, that they have a great experience implementing. So that's, that's important for us as well. So what... Uh, is available anywhere in the with the right technology. Now, uh, I've been asked on other podcasts, well, is geothermal anywhere really makes sense? And I've said yes and no. Yes, from a technical point of view. Um, no, from an econo eco economic point of view, techno-economic uh, point of view. But the uh, purpose of uh, Green Fire is to assess uh, where we can make uh, geothermal anywhere or geothermal in particular locations economic, techno-economic. So obviously with conventional geothermal on the left-hand side of this slide, um, you have to have sufficient access to the natural hot, hot brine uh, to have an injection well and production well. And those have the uh, challenges that we all know about from conventional geothermal. Unconventional geothermal uh, comes in basic two uh, categories. One is the enhanced geothermal systems that we've, uh, which involve the fracking. Um, and still have separate wells uh, with uh, the resource, you know, water in the resource going between injection wells and production wells and uh, with the fracking issues uh, and uh, 
seismic issues associated with uh, enhanced geothermal systems being a big advantage actually for our advanced geothermal systems. On the right-hand side of this slide, you see um, the U-loop approach and our, our uh, uh, advanced geothermal uh, systems approach, which is, uh, which, oh, you still see my slides? Yeah, we can, yep. Okay, good. Uh, the U-loop approach um, and uh, uh, a coaxial approach, and these are the advanced geothermal systems using a closed loop system. And the idea here is to uh, access hot rock with sufficient permeability and blurred saturation so it can be techno-economic, uh, not just possible from a uh, uh, energy production point of view. Okay, another way to look at uh, what we call a green loop, uh, where uh, green fire and closed loop put together, we call it green loop and we've trademarked that. <laughs> but, um, so this works across, we work across the entire spectrum of uh, glo global geothermal resources or can at least. Um, so uh, apologies for the simplicity of this graph because it only has two parameters and from uh, actual implementation, uh, there are many parameters for the assessment of a closed loop uh, resource. But looking at the two biggest parameters, temperature and uh, permeability and water resources and pressure and all that, is um, the resource mass. Um, uh, the conventional geothermal is great. When, it, when, it, when you get a great conventional geothermal well, it's the best thing in the world. We're, we're not suggesting you change it. Uh, but it does operate typically only in a, a, a relatively narrow range of temperature and permeability. Whereas with our system, we can go across a much greater range from everything from hot dry rock to uh, uh, permeability and lower temperature areas. Um, and uh, uh, so the much broader range allow of uh, 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 techno-economic uh, viability allows uh, um, uh, green loop technology to work across the entire spectrum. And the geothermal well, uh, we're often um, asked by a geothermal companies, well, that but what can you do for my bad wells now? Uh, and this is a good upper, uh, opportunity, especially since it's more of an operation and maintenance uh, stability. And so often we can start with, with wells that don't fit to a um, retrofit of those wells. And since you don't have to drill the well and often, and we typically, as I'll describe, uh, can you use the existing surface system uh, for energy uh, production uh, can be uh, very economic. Um, so with these uh, initial projects, we often then uh, use those as proof of concept retrofits for, for showing that availability of the technology in uh, the resource as a whole. So that allows us to expand within uh, various fields. And we have projects now we're expanding um, as a result of that, including at the geysers, the largest geothermal location in the world here in Northern California. Uh, so we're planning uh, projects with Calpine uh, there, for example, uh, to be an expansion project. And, and the uh, and, and we can then also look at new geothermal uh, greenfield uh, projects, right? So what is the green fire, uh, our green loop, uh, we call that a closed loop technology. But the key here is that we, our technology, there's, they will, uh, you know, give us the uh, parameters uh, for, so we could install your system and we often respond well give us the parameters of your system and what uh, of your geothermal resource because we can tailor our technology with different versions of our closed loop approach to match and optimize from a techno-economic perspective um, the application in particular geothermal resources so we can tailor our projects to fit the resource and this applies 
uh, uh, for thermodynamic uh, modeling. We have a proprietary system. We've spent uh, 10 years now uh, developing our, our modeling uh, technology, advance the uh, uh, application and prediction in uh, across a very broad range of uh, geothermal resources and also across, uh, with implementation on the economic side from uh, rolling nigs and everything. Yeah. So, um, oh, okay. So the, uh, we have uh, uh, the generation of the geothermal power from existing wells and fields, new resources too. So the benefits of all of this is we can accelerate the generation of clean, continuous, renewable, reliable power and uh, provide innovative geothermal experience and deliver these superior project outcomes um, over shorter terms. Uh, you probably, uh, most people know that, uh, I guess the historical average for developing a new geothermal project is seven years. Well, if we're doing a retrofit, we can do that in a year. Uh, and also if we're working existing geothermal resource um, that where the owner and operator of the resource already knows a lot about the resource, then, we can use the uh, the technology already understood about that, and that is uh, part of the infrastructure that is very useful. It's knowledge infrastructure and actual infrastructure in geothermal resource, and where that infrastructure is available, and it is available in all all existing geothermal uh, resources where there are plants, um, then we can do a project. In a year, uh, including a new project uh, with a down, new downboard. So instead of seven years, we can accelerate uh, the uh, general uh, uh, geothermal process. This is also allows us, uh, our technology allows the de risking of conventional geothermal. And how do we de risk conventional geothermal? Well, one easiest ways, but uh, the easiest way is uh, when you're drilling a new geothermal well, recognize a, a prospect that there's a good chance it'll be a failure uh, up front or a failure over time as the resource changes or the uh, area around uh, the well uh, changes. So that installing a downbore heat exchanger in, in those wells, uh, our technology can give you a good well where you previously had a failure well. So that's a de-risking. And so we are talking with a number of uh, the geothermal companies about making sure they use, for example, appropriate diameters when they're drilling their wells so that we could add a downpour heat exchanger and get a good well, even if they have a failure well. Okay. One of my favorite uh, <laughs> topics um, yeah, for uh, geothermal because I like hot springs. Uh, I lived in Japan for a while and with the onsens there, because many of the advantages in the tailoring of our closed loop system are appropriate for different geothermal resources. You would think a hot spring is a great geothermal resource, but in most locations, including uh, Japan, um, there has been a political problem with doing any geothermal very near a hot spring, which is ironic, but understandable because if you're going to, enter, if you're ge a conventional geothermal system would presumably interfere with the uh, development and the production of the hot spring resource to the surface. But with a closed loop geothermal system, as in this diagram, you can go down, grab the heat, not grab the, um, and not grab the, the water resource fluid. Um, instead, the fluid uh, simply, uh, or, or working fluid goes down, the blue line here goes down, uh, picks up the heat, brings it up and makes, um, and we can have uh, uh, direct use or uh, power production at the surface. And this is just an example of the tailoring uh, that a closed loop can apply to open up resources to other opportunities. So people often ask, well, what, what, what are the parameters uh, <laughs> for closed loop geothermal? And uh, we've uh, worked that out and worked with Baker Hughes and other uh, partners uh, and uh, looking at these alternatives. So 
for power generation on the left side of this slide, you'll see um, that you know there we have uh, geothermal uses at various different temperatures, and the direct use is available at uh, temperatures and and uh, uh, very various depths as well. But there are also um, we can use uh, decarbonization, and uh, we uh, work with other companies, Mosaic, Bloom Energy, Air Products, and uh, on strategic acquisitions and investments and, and uh, partnership for direct air capture opportunities, too. Um, this is not currently our prime focus, but uh, we are working on those projects as, as well. But why consider uh, geothermal for direct air capture? Well, direct air capture needs heat. Uh, all of those, uh, as I understand it, direct air capture systems need heat. And geothermal can be extracted anywhere, so it offers some modularity with direct air capture. The systems can be coupled to provide electricity with them. So why consider geothermal for hydrogen hubs? Well, hydrogen also needs heat, whether you're talking of analysis or chemical. Substantially more efficient at higher temperatures. So again, this is another uh, cost effective uh, for us. Um, then uh, the uh, steam in two phase example of uh, Green Loop is one of my one of my favorites. Uh, this is. Um, uh, some people call it, uh, pun intended, hot product, um, because, um, and this is what we're implementing actually at the, the geysers, and the concept here is that we take the steam and into you know, uh, Western United States, so, uh, you know, uh, Kenjin in Africa and uh, Kenya. Um, these are huge uh, steam and two-phase resources. How does our closed loop uh, system capture that? Well, the steam and two-phase fluid, as you can see from the lower right-hand side, comes in through the perforated lining. It is station, and because it's a phase change, that's a good that's a good deal of heat. And then it just Descends, and then the condensed fluid descends and returns to the reservoir with the hydrostatic pressure. And what we do is design the wells for pressure is plenty to turn the condensed fluid back into the resource. Um, and this process is also uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab as part of our uh, project with the uh, Calpine at the geysers, and they have confirmed this process and it's much better than conventional. Well, why is that? Well, um, you're, <laughs> the hydrostatic, we control uh, the saturation temperature and the saturation pressure around the, uh, the well. Why? Because we control the working fluid 100%, not just the type of working fluid, but the temperature of the working fluid, which then uh, controls um, the various aspects, uh, condensation um, and uh, condensed, uh, uh, condensation issues or, or other issues associated with the uh, a technology or a, a resource. So, sorry, oops. Okay, so uh, this allows the, the working fluid uh, to set uh, control of the saturation temperature and uh, the, the resource uh, availability and keep the resource flowing and essentially allows us to harvest only the heat and not the resource water or steam two-phase fluid. Um, also, because it's a closed loop system, we can choose whichever working fluid we want. So we could have, we can use an ORC fluid 
and avoid having an ORC uh, heat exchanger and just having an ORC uh, power production system at the surface. And one of the things our customers uh, do is they tell us, the uh, oh, working fluid to the surface with the uh, pressures and temperatures uh, that will Well, apologies, everybody. We, Joe seems to be having some internet connection issues. Of the um, supercritical CO2. So we actually didn't even need a pump at the surface. So that's another potential advantage. Okay. So we have a number of, of patents uh, that are associated with this uh, all around the world. Um, the one I like best is this uh, um, one at um, at um, on the upper left hand side are steam and two phase green load patents. And part of the reason I like that, maybe you can see my my folder here. Here's a patent uh, for that one with uh, from the U.S. patent with our. Uh, with guess what, my name on the top of it, and I'm not a. I'm only a lawyer. I'm not a. Uh, I'm not an engineer, but I was in the room. The room with the engineers when they came up with the idea and wrote the patent application. So that's our steam and two phase green loop patent structure. We also have on the right hand side so multiple uh, U loop patents, and so the concept that many people think of in closed loop uh, geothermal is having these U loops. And uh, for example, ever uses U loops. Uh, for example, the uh, and then for hydrogen uh, production, uh, we also have patents because, as I mentioned earlier, um, whether you're um, using electrolysis or the chemical production uh, in inside the Denver heat exchanger, it's much more efficient at higher temperatures. So, using geothermal heat for hydrogen production, we have done, uh, patents on that. We also have a patent we haven't uh, in wells. Um, so we, we've we taken this approach over the last 10 years and it's very helpful. And uh, some of our customers uh, reach out to us because of our patent position. They've heard about it. A project for them that we tailored with a surface reboiler system. Um, and we're currently doing a steam and two phase uh, project uh, uh, that we, uh, we're being awarded uh, now uh, with them as well. So, from a power generation point of view, uh, we have these uh, uh, both greenfield projects and retrofit projects, is generally how they start, as I uh, suggested. And then um, the uh, with the initial retrofit, it's a proof of concept to show that our technology in in that particular uh, resource works, so we can expand within that field. So obviously, there's also the opportunity to have direct use, so heating and cooling, various industrial applications, and we're getting contacted from other uh, from a number of companies that say we don't. Uh, care how much the power costs. We just want to make sure that we can have direct air capture and we can use your direct use heat. And so um, when the cost of a, a particular um, of geothermal and a particular resource is not a huge uh, issue, then the implementation uh, with our closed loop technology is always possible. So this is a picture of the geysers uh, in uh, California here. It's just up north of us a few miles. And uh, this is the uh, known to be the largest geothermal resource in the world. Um, now, 25 years ago or so, it was producing at 1.4 gigawatts, I think. Um, um, but then uh, within the last uh, 
15 years, it's gone down to about half of that. And the, resor the reason is that it's a largely a steam and two-phase resource, which of course is good from our perspective. And one of the reasons that our steam and two-phase uh, project is being implemented there. Um, but the problem um, that our steam and two-phase green loop approach solves is preserving water in the resource, not, not using the water, as you can see from this picture here. Where's the water go? Up in the air? Not with our closed loop technology. This is the existing system. So we can preserve the long-term sustainability and actually and uh, replace the long-term sustainability because the existing injection wells uh, at places like the geysers then can replenish the resource that has been degraded over time. So our solution is to produce the heat, not the water to the surface. Um, and uh, we can optimize the working fluid type to minimize the parasitic pumping power. Um, and uh, we, uh, I mentioned earlier, we uh, uh, negotiated with the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab under our, oh, this project, by the way, is funded largely by the California Energy Commission. We received a grant from them last year on this, and uh, it's, it's hosted by Calpine, who runs most of the, uh, owns most of the oppor opportunities at the Kaisers. So, um, but the Lawrence Berkeley did a, uh, has done a lot of research uh, in the past at the geysers. And so we asked them also to uh, research and, and model out our technology at the geysers. And they have uh, recently uh, submitted their final reports um, to us. And that will be included in the paper we are presenting, guess where? At the Geothermal Rising Conference in October. Um, and Lawrence Berkeley, National Lab is confirming the uh, preference for our closed loop technology in such resources, um, partly because uh, uh, you don't have the problems that are associated with having injection wells um, because, and uh, uh, seismic issues are often an issue, particularly with EGS, but not with our, our technology, AGS. Um, and also with certain conventional geothermal when you're injecting into the resource, you can cause seismic issues as well, but we're not injecting, we're just harvesting heat, not the resource. So this is a picture of our project at COSO again. Um, we did, uh, we also received a grant from the California Energy Commission five years ago. This is a pro the project that was um, finished at uh, the US Navy's China Lake, China Lake location. Um, back in 2019 that we did, and we appreciate COSO's help on that. They were very helpful. The, uh, we showed that, that we could use water, which we, and, and we also tested supercritical CO2 there and showed that that would pump itself and that we could use this as a heat transport and uh, working fluids and demonstrated the value of a closed loop system and being able to use different working fluids. And we showed that we could, make product, uh, production could be 10 times greater uh, if fully implemented at uh, COSO. And in the well we had there, we could produce it at uh, you know 1.2 megawatts on a, uh, a well that was not used because the, uh, it had non-condensable gases. Uh, it was only a non-condensable gas well and it couldn't otherwise be used with the system, but we could make power with it. Okay. So one of the questions we've been asked for many years now, we were in the Shell Game Changer program seven years ago when, <laughs> when it was still operative. And one of our first questions was, well, if you have this uh, closed loop technology, why can't you use it to retrofit um, unproductive oil and gas wells? And we looked at it and we said, well, yes, we can, but it will be, but the techno-economics are gonna depend on the oil and gas wells, whether they have the, uh, permeability and heat and, and, and whatnot that is uh, necessary for some level of, of economic uh, production. And um, so, but we concluded as they did at the time that even if we could only retrofit a small portion of the millions of oil and gas wells that are out there um, that are subject to being plugged and abandoned, that would still be a huge market for our technology's application. And particularly with the focus on oil and gas wells uh, uh, 
transition to uh, green technology, that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, and I got in trouble on one podcast uh, because I said there were millions of oil and gas wells that were uh, potentially uh, could be um, available to and from being uh, plugged and abandoned for available for retrofits. And I was told, no, it's not millions. It's tens of millions of uh, potential abandoned oil and gas wells. So again, even a, a modest portion of retrofitting all of those wells is going to be a huge market. And we are coupling our uh, technologies with other industrial applications to improve the economics of this. In particular, we're working at the Energy Innovation Center in Oklahoma City. So, and here's a picture of the Energy Innovation Center and Baker Hughes is our strategic partner and they own and run the Energy Innovation Center in Oklahoma City. Uh, there are a number of our uh, customer uh, friends that are now members of the consortium. Uh, several are listed on this slide, Chesapeake and uh, Impex Continental. And I think there are three more now that aren't listed yet. So this is a growing opportunity because there's so much focus on the potential for using our technology. And this will be a, a, a testing uh, amongst in a essentially a large real lab well um, of uh, our technology uh, across uh, an almost infinite number of parameters. Uh, and that is uh, what is going to be most useful for assessing which wells, uh, oil and gas wells, are going to be uh, most appropriate for uh, retrofitting with our technology. And so we're working with uh, Valorac and uh, uh, in particular using their vacuum insulated tubing in this uh, you know, Wells to Watts consortium in Oklahoma City. So the uh, world-class, uh, this is a, a picture of the well uh, itself. And I'll leave that to Baker Hughes to describe if you come to the uh, Oklahoma City uh, meetings that will be had at, after the GRC meeting in October. So what about our people ask about our commercial projects? Where are they in the world? Where? Well, I've listed here where we're working ar around the world. Um, and we have some examples I can talk about that I'm not sure we have time. Um, and. Uh, uh, the United States, Latin America, Japan, where we completed a project uh, last year, and we have some new new steam and two-phase project progress uh, going there. Uh, Philippines projects we've done, Indonesia, um, uh, Taiwan, we've been, uh, uh, been in the tender offer process there, and we have a memorandum of understanding with CPC uh, to move forward. Uh, that's also public information. So, um, I won't take a lot of time on this slide, uh, but uh, 2023 has been a big year for us, both in terms of uh, uh, opportunities to talk to the world, and in particular, here in July, the Geothermal Rising Full Steam Ahead webcast that we're talking on now. But we also have uh, projects where uh, we've been selected as an uh, energy in innovation uh, uh, pioneer, for example. So we have uh, the, uh, and in September, we're going to be in uh, Indonesia and, uh, and uh, the Philippines presenting at the National Geothermal Association of the Philippines. So we'll see you there. Um, or we'll see you, of course, in uh, October at the Geothermal Rising Conference in Reno. Looking forward to that. Okay. And then following that, there is uh, a uh, conference that uh, Baker Hughes is hosting at our Wells to Watts Consortium meeting in Oklahoma City that uh, if you are particularly interested in the uh, oil and gas opportunities and that they will be tested at the Wells to Watts Consortium, uh, then that could be available for visiting as well. So what are the, what's the conclusion of all of this? Well, uh, <laughs> We have a highly flexible closed loop uh, technology that we tailor to particular uh, resources. And this gives us the ability to work across the whole spectrum and generate power from existing wells, uh, expand uh, from uh, existing, existing resources, and then have new projects, uh, new green 
greenfield projects too, although they typically start with existing uh, geothermal resources because they are well known, the infrastructure is all in place and cheap. Uh, we don't have to pay for the infrastructure if it's already there, uh, particularly all the information about the resource. The green fire uh, benefits of all this is we can have, make reliable geothermal energy. It's innovative, it's superior outcomes, and it's faster. Um, so, uh, and uh, we have, and there, there are various um, resource advantages um, about uh, closed loop systems, such as reduced uh, um, seismicity, things like that. And, uh, and the basic advantage of uh, our technology being a closed loop, one of the most fundamental is that we're harvesting the heat and not the resource itself. So where the resource has long-term sustainability by definition. Okay, so I think it's time for questions and answers. Are we on time? Yeah, you're doing a great job. So uh, we actually have a, a lot of questions that are coming in from the audience. Okay. Um, and so let me, um, well, we'll get into some of these now. Um, so just to start, Joe, uh, we have a question here. What is the minimum and maximum downboard temperatures that Green Loop can work with? Minimum and maximum downboard temperatures. Okay. <laughs> I have a, a file that I'm going to try to share, but maybe you can, uh, uh, uh do you have that, that, that file? Uh, we... We have, um, I, I think we sent it to you earlier, um, Brian or Graham. I'll try to share it. Okay, well, yeah, we'll try to share it too here if, uh, by, um, for you here. So hold on. Um, and and uh, maybe we can move on, Joe, to the one of the other questions here is, and we can come back to that to the the temperature question. Um, what are some of the what are the working fluids that are used in in this this uh, AGS closed loop system? Um, and sort of what what are some of the parameters that are used that you all have found to determine what are the best working fluids? Oh, the working fluids. Yeah. Well, um, it, 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 we usually start with water because it's, a, it's always available. And uh, from my um, resource uh, uh, evaluation point of view and permitting point of view, there's no never any question about water. Uh, uh, from a, a modeling of using organic Rankin cycle fluids, uh, we uh, that has big advantages if it's an ORC system on the surface, or it's going to be best with an ORC system on the surface. So that's um, uh, a real ad advantage. Um, oh, good, you got the key characteristics. Uh, you put that slide up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got this slide up for you here. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, but uh, getting back, uh, what was the question again? It was, uh, uh, it was about the the working fluids and, and working, yeah the working fluids. So we've and uh, I meant as I mentioned uh, we've uh, tested at COSO uh, our um, supercritical CO two fluid and uh, some fluids don't require the um, uh, pumping and that's an advantage because uh, with a closed loop system of course you have to uh, use some of the power that uh, generated to pump the closed loop fluid. Right. So if you don't have to pump, that's 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 a good deal. So choosing and one of the things we uh, presented at the Stanford Geothermal Workshop is a paper and we'll be talking about it at the GRC meeting um, in October as well of um, alternatives of using different fluids. And uh, so when we talk about tailoring our technology for particular resources, it also includes looking at and modeling it with different working fluids. Um, so, but, you know, typically we start with water, we'll look at uh, supercritical CO2 and or ORC fluids, but others are possible as well. Great, thanks. And do you wanna go back to that other question about the minimum and maximum downbore? Yeah, uh, there's, no, there's, there's, no minimum, there's no real minimum and there's no real maximum, but people do ask as well, what, is, uh, what are some of the parameters that would be useful? So the, here's a, the, we have on your, the slide here, the key characteristics of good candidate wells. 
Um, and uh, uh, the low column is uh, not very attractive. The base is what we would look to in order to prioritize the project and as a uh, one that's good to work with in terms of enthalpy, reservoir pressure, feed zones, and I don't know, we can go through it in more detail if we have time. Um, um, and obviously the high column uh, was, is the best uh, opportunity. And so we would prioritize opportunities in the high pro the high column over the other columns. Okay, great. Um, so another question that came up and you, you had a, a, a chart on this, but um, are you finding that there are certain regions in the United States or around the globe that are more, that are ideal for the green loop um, technology? Well, uh, green loop uh, generally is, um, you know, available and can be used in any any resource around the world. But the steam in two phase uh, uh, solution that I, you know, we're testing out of the geysers, implementing in the Philippines, and uh, we'll be using in uh, Taiwan, for example, as well, um, and. Uh, uh, is excellent for uh, a lot of existing res resources. Uh, the most famous one in that regard is the geysers, and uh, um, but also is the geysers here in, Cal in California. So those are um, so the existing geothermal resources around the world are the obvious where uh, area for green fire to spend from a commercial point of view because the infrastructure is already there, the resources are fully known. You don't have to do exploratory wells just to find out about them. Uh, that said, we do have uh, companies approaching us from, to say, well, we want to. Uh, produce power. It's got to be green power, and we want to do it in a certain location. We understand your closed loop technology can be uh, useful and apply anywhere uh, in any resource. And the answer is yes. Is it going to be techno-economic? We respond. And they said, well, uh, for many of these opportunities, we don't care how much we have to pay for the, uh, the energy. <laughs> we just need to make sure it's green and it's available in a certain location. So if you can increase the price of the cost of energy or the price paid for the energy, yes, we can go anywhere in the world. But currently, the focus is on, um, you know, ring of fire type of opportunities and then places, uh, for example, in Africa and Europe where there are existing geothermal uh, opportunities uh, as well. Does that answer that question? Yeah, I think so. Um, and and the follow up question to that is um, where has the, where are the green loops uh, producing electricity around the globe right now? A green loop um, uh, making electricity uh, around the the globe. Yeah, Jen, are, do you have any? Does the is the technology putting any um, uh, electrons on the grid yet in in anywhere in, around the globe where you're? Where you have projects, so. yeah, we have test we have test projects, but none are um, um, in process. And uh, for example, our one at uh, uh, Calpine, and we have uh, uh, projects um, in uh, other uh, areas. Uh, for example, we did a project uh, last uh, you know, finished last year in the Philippines Energy Development Corporation for um, uh, a surface system. Um, uh, reboiler, and we took a well that was high non-conductible gases, and it's now producing between two and a half and three megawatts. Um, so that's a that's another opportunity. But most of the uh, technology that I've described here is still in uh, production mode at various locations. So if you ask me to give you a uh, take you on a tour of steam and uh, two phase green loop project, I'm going to have to say you'll have to wait a couple of months. <laughs> gotcha. Cool. Um, well, th that'll be, it'll be exciting. Um, just so another question here, what are the types of regulatory challenges or, or sort of policy challenges, challenges that you are experiencing as you're trying to create these new projects and opportunities um, right. in, both in the United right. States? Right. You mean from a permitting point of view or something like that? Or uh, yeah, maybe from a permitting point of view or had, just any had, challenges you're experiencing. Yeah, we're not having those sorts of challenges. But, uh, our permits have all been granted without uh, real difficulty. And the fact that it's steam and to, or it's a closed loop system and we're not, you know, we're harvesting only the heat 
and not uh, the resource. Um, and indeed, the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, study that came out talked about the advantages of, of harvesting only the heat and not um, modifying the flow or, or uh, it also um, has uh, chemical advantages in the resource. So we're uh, not just um, uh, can we avoid problems on the well uh, or the downboard heat exchanger, but we're not changing the uh, uh, the resources uh, with our system because it's closed loop. We're not harvesting. So that's the advantage of a advanced geothermal over or one of the advantages over of advanced geothermal over uh, enhanced uh, geothermal because we're not uh, changing the fundamentals of the resource. And so one of the examples they pointed out is the seismic impact uh, should be zero as yeah. opposed to other opportunities where you're actually moving and or fracking uh, the resource in order to enhance or allow uh, the permeability in the resource. Okay, interesting. This is a uh, sort of a quick question here, but uh, is there a database for abandoned oil and gas wells around the world or in certain countries? Um, this person is interested in, in knowing where those tens of millions of wells are, I guess, and, and they're, they yeah. also have a question of you know, what, what's the hottest. Are there certain yeah, regions uh, hot oil and uh, gas wells? I don't know about, I, I think there are uh, sources on that, but maybe you can, uh, 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 we could debate, we could, uh, ask our contacts at Baker Hughes uh, that help us with that uh, principally. And uh, this is part of what the Wells to Watts Consortium is doing. And you know, Rob Klenner, but he's uh, head of the Wells to Watts Consortium and works with Green Fire and applying our technology at the Wells to Watts Consortium. So I think that's the, those are the people to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know there's, it, it's not, I, we all wish that there was uh, um, that data all in one central location. Mm -hmm. um, so will Green, Green Loop work in non-conventional geothermal fields or regions and-, and um, Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, our, our project in Japan that we completed uh, last year, or I guess two years ago now, um, was at a hot dry rock resource in, in Japan where we inserted our vacuum insulated tubing and did the testing and validated our uh, uh, the modeling of our technology in a hot dry rock uh, location, right? Um, now that's not a commercial project, but yes, it has been, uh, we've shown that it can be done. And we gave, uh, the host of that, uh, project in Japan, uh, 15 different scenarios of, uh, implementing, uh, technology, uh, depending on how they wanted to use their resource and how much they wanted to spend. Okay. So here's a, an interesting question. So if, if uh, abandoned or exhausted oil and gas wells are producing H H2S from the formation, in addition to carbon dioxide, do, is the removal of the H2S required before utilizing a supercritical working fluid? Is the removal I, 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 this is a bit technical for me, so apologies. Uh, if... <laughs> it's a little bit technical for me. Uh, maybe whoever's asking that question, uh, maybe you can send us an email and I'll uh, review it with my tech guys. I'm a lawyer, uh, but that's the sort of, but it's a good question and it's an interesting one and, and an example of how um, we, we tailor our solutions to the particular issues involved in a particular situation. Yeah, it might, it might be related, and uh, Bill, you should send us your e the question via email, follow up with us, Bill, um, but it might be related to Iceland, where they do have a little bit of H2S that uh, is released from those geothermal wells, and so this could be a, a this is an interesting question. Well, we do, we have a, a, a lot of uh, uh, opportunities now that we're being asked about of, you know, carbon sequestration, so whether, you know, um, you know, that can relate to the H2S situations as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, wanted Someone wanted to get back to your, your comment about de-risking um, dry wells. And if you could talk a little bit more about how you're using these failed or dry wells um, and, and actually making them productive. Um, so they were just wanting to talk a little bit, you to talk a little bit more about that. 
Well, our part, uh, uh, the economics are, uh, as I showed on our uh, slide earlier, and you can tell from this key characteristic slide in terms of the uh, permeability are always better uh, for us at, if there is permeability. And the permeability can be a range, but to do a hot, dry rock project is going to be uh, uh, require a higher price paid for the electricity than um, than a uh, one with uh, permeability, because obviously the permeability has been something that is key to conventional geothermal and uh, our green loop approach. Uh, not only can take advantage of that, but then preserve uh, by harvesting only the heat rather than harvesting the, the permeability of the water to the surface, we can preserve that resource over a long period of time. Um, so uh, to answer the question, uh, hot dry rock uh, projects are not our current priority right now because of economics, but where uh, we do have customers that are saying they want to do a hot dry rock project, we do work with them to develop and uh, plan it, uh, but it's going to, it'll, it'll cost more on a per kilowatt basis than a permeable uh, resource. Okay. And, and, uh, and some of the hot dry rock projects are focused on direct air capture as a, 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 an alternative too. Well, Joe, um, we are out of time and we want to be respectful of, of the audience's time and yours as well. Um, we've learned a lot. Uh, we have a lot of questions that we did not get to. Uh, so what we will do is, uh, Joe, Joe, we'll share that with you and your team. And if you want to, if you all can respond to them and we'll, we'll send the responses out to everyone who registered um, so that you can, you can get a response to your question. Um, thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, we learned a lot from you, Joe, and appreciate you taking the time to teach us and, and uh, help us learn about uh, Green Loop and, and what Green Fire is up to around the world. Good. Well, I look forward to it and we'll see you and, uh, and hopefully all the attendees at the Geothermal Rising Conference in early October. That's right. So register now. Uh, it's we are filling up quick, and um, there's there's uh, gonna, it's going to be a really great event. So we look forward to seeing everybody. Okay, see you all there. And we're delivering a paper there that will uh, uh, be, it's very technically uh, backed up and it's uh, mostly regarding our, our STEAM and two-phase uh, green loop uh, technology, uh, but it goes into detail and answers some of the questions that um, have been asked here relating to uh, application of closed loop in such resources, okay? Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll be excited to learn more. So thank you everyone for joining and, and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, Brad. Bye. Bye-bye.